Welcome back to Historical Context. Today, we continue our Jamestown unit, and we talk about a topic that I've wanted to talk about for some time, in essence, since I started this podcast, and that is the truth about Pocahontas and the life that she lived and what we know about her based on the writings of the individuals who lived in that area. And so Jamestown, where we left off, was in 1611. It had gone through a winter that was better than the prior winter, which was a starving time. And in August of 1611, Sir Thomas Gates, who left in the last episode, returns. And he comes back with 280 new settlers. This brings the population of Jamestown to 700 people. Gates reassumes command as deputy governor. And while there is no evidence of strife between Sir Thomas Gates and Sir Dale, who was the prior deputy governor, uh, Sir Thomas Dale would, the month after Gates arrives, take 300 settlers and leave Jamestown, going upriver and founding a new colony that they named Henrico, and that was named after James I's eldest son. In fact, it's doubtful that Dale and Gates had strife because the laws we discussed in the previous episode remained in place. So, as you'll recall, Gates had a set of laws, Dale had a set of laws, and those two sets continued to move together through this time. So it's unlikely that the two had really that far opposing views of one another. There are a couple of letters that survived this era, along with some writings compiled by Captain John Smith back in England. In a 1612 letter from William Crashaw to Sir Thomas Smith, Crashaw notes that the primary plantings of the colony were hemp and flax. These were used for cordage and linen. And so I want people to pause here for a second and understand that there are folks out there that believe Jamestown was founded to cultivate tobacco. That wasn't the case. They didn't really know what they were going to be doing when they went to Jamestown. They just knew that they had to raise something to trade. And in 1612, it was hemp and flax. Livestock at the time, according to Crashaw, consisted of poultry, conies, goats, swine, and kine. In December of 1611, Captain Newport... Remember him, he was back at Fort supplying Jamestown with, essentially with needed supplies and people. He leaves and never returns. It is surmised that Captain Newport had a poor relationship with Sir Thomas Dale. And so Captain Newport would return to England and never come back to Jamestown. The winter of 1611-1612 was rather uneventful, and in April of 1612, George Percy would leave Jamestown, and he would never return. Now, unlike some others, uh, Percy would remain involved with the affairs of the Virginia Company. He would just do so from England and not come back to Jamestown. Samuel Argyll, who we talked about in the last episode, returned to Jamestown in the fall of 1612. This is where he becomes historically significant because in April of 1613, while trading with friendly natives, Argyll recognizes Pocahontas, the daughter of Chief Powhatan, and captures her with the hopes of negotiating a peace and a release of prisoners from her father. The exchange was actually captured in Smith's writings. Let's have a look. This unwelcome news much troubled Powhatan because he loved both his daughter and our commodities well. Yet it was three months after 
he returned us any answer. Then by the persuasion of the council, he returned seven of our men, with each of them an unserviceable musket, and sent us word that when we would deliver his daughter, he would make us satisfaction for all injuries done us and give us 500 bushels of corn and forever be friends with us. That he sent we received in part of payment and returned him this answer, that his daughter should be well used, but we could not believe the rest of our arms were either lost or stolen from him, and therefore till he sent them, we would keep his daughter. Seven English returned from Powhatan prisoners. So Powhatan essentially tries to meet their demands, and the settlers respond by saying, well, our weapons are gone, and you mustn't have lost all of them, and so until we see them back, we're keeping Pocahontas. The colonists went to visit Powhatan to try to finalize the exchange, but they were fired upon by natives, uh, thus negating any opportunity there. Then, on the other side, two of Pocahontas's brothers came to see her, and seeing that she was treated well, they went back and asked their father to pursue peace and her release. Powhatan agreed to a meeting, and the colonists sent two men to meet with him, one being John Rolfe. The two men did not speak to Powhatan, but did see his brother, who assured them a peaceful harvest. The two returned to Jamestown, and the corn crop as a result of the promises was planted. Captain Argyll would lead a group to the natives to conclude a formal peace agreement. Meanwhile, John Rolfe would do something historically significant to Jamestown, and that is in July of 1613, he would harvest the first verified tobacco crop that is then shipped to London uh, from Jamestown. So John Rolfe brings tobacco to America. In 1614, John Rolfe writes a letter to Sir Thomas Dale where he makes a stunning admission. Let's have a look. For the converting to the true knowledge of God and Jesus Christ, an unbelievable creature, namely Pocahontas, to whom my heart and best thoughts are, and have a long time been so entangled, and enthralled in so intricate of a labyrinth, that I was even a wary to unwind myself thereout. And for those of you on the YouTube channel, you could see that John Rolfe was not the best of writers. So I apologize if I uh, tangled up some of those words. But essentially, John Rolfe had fallen in love with Pocahontas. And Pocahontas, during this time in captivity, was baptized into Christianity and married John Rolfe in 1614. She would change her name to Rebecca. Now, right before all this happened, in uh, the winter of 1613-1614, Sir Thomas Gates leaves for England and leaves Sir Thomas Dale in charge. At this point, foreign interference begins to play a role in the colony. It is discovered that there is a French settlement in the northern part of Virginia, and Dale sends Captain Argyll to handle the situation. Argyll captures their ship and many supplies, but the Frenchmen end up escaping into the woods. Other accounts of the story actually state that the Frenchmen were captured and allowed to return to France. John Rolfe writes in 1614 that a man named William Parker was recovered from the Powhatan tribe after living among them for three years. So, kind of going back to this idea of assimilation again, and, and 
what was going on, it appears again that other Europeans were spending lengthy amounts of time living with the Powhatan tribe, many of whom were likely doing so against their will. Captain Argyll would return to England in June of 1614, and at the same time, a lottery was instituted to raise money for the Virginia Company. Now, unfortunately, due to what could be any number of circumstances, very little is recorded of the events of Jamestown from the middle of 1614 up to early 1616. In April of 1616, Sir Thomas Dale leaves for England and George Yardley is named deputy governor. Yardley was a survivor of the third supply uh, voyage that came to Jamestown in 1610, and Yardley would have a varying impact over the Jamestown colony throughout the next decade. He really comes across, as I read a lot of this, as a man the colonists really respected. Dale leaves to go to England with John Rolfe, his wife Pocahontas, their one-year-old son, and about a dozen Powhatan natives. Now that's where I want to pause because there are some people out there who have a different perception of Pocahontas. My wife and I had a conversation uh, prior to my writing of this episode and she talked about the movie Pocahontas, which is an animated movie when she was a kid. I never had the opportunity to see it, but I tested her. I said, you know, did they cover in the movie the time that Pocahontas went to England and how all of that went? And she looked at me like I was crazy. But yes, it's true, and it's memorialized in various writings, not just one. But Pocahontas left with her husband and landed in Plymouth, England in June of 1616. And this is at a time when William Shakespeare is alive in England. Uh, different things are occurring in the country. And so Pocahontas and other members of her tribe arrive. And throughout the remainder of 1616, Pocahontas is presented to several high-level English officials and even has the opportunity to meet King James. And this was an attempt by the Virginia Company, essentially, to say that the natives in Virginia could become civilized individuals and join the British crown. John Smith, and if you'll recall again, going back to your thoughts about John Smith and Pocahontas, I think people thought they had this long-term, intricate relationship, but we've already established seven years prior that John Smith left Jamestown and never came back. This is where his writings about Pocahontas increase, with a majority of his transcripts about her coming after she came to England. In fact, Smith would write a letter to Queen Anne detailing his version of events after the Queen met Pocahontas, and that, would, and that version of events meaning his interactions with her when he was in Virginia. It's believed that Smith did this to try and increase his reputation since Pocahontas was essentially a, a celebrity or a rising star, if you will, in English society. So think about it. Smith is back home trying to find a relevant life, writing about the events going on in Virginia. And here comes Pocahontas landing in Virginia, being touted about uh, the different nobilities and the courts, you know, meeting very high-profile people. Smith appears to be trying to piggyback on that by writing these letters now, essentially attaching himself to Pocahontas. In fact, Smith's writing of Pocahontas jumping on him to save his life matches a story he told of a young Turk girl jumping on him to save his life when he was a prisoner in 1602. 
So if you read the entirety of John Smith's writings, you'll see that he alleges he was actually saved twice by a young girl jumping on him, the first being in 1602. This pattern leads many historians to believe that the Pocahontas saving John Smith's story and their relationship was likely a fabrication of John Smith's. And I have to personally say that I kind of agree with that, considering the fact that while he was in Virginia, he wasn't extensively writing about her. This writing only occurred when it was advantageous to his reputation to do so. Pocahontas and John Ralph were set to return and actually sailed to leave England for Virginia in March of 1617. Pocahontas and her husband were with Samuel Argyll on the trip back. Unfortunately, shortly after boarding the ship, Pocahontas became sick, and while they were ported in another English town, she died a few days later. She's actually buried in England at St. George's Parish, but her exact location is unknown because the church uh, where you usually mark, you figure out where a grave was in relation to a church, the church was destroyed uh, sometime, I believe it was in the 18th century. She was believed at the time to be 20 or 21 years old. Her death, while tragic, did not stop her husband from returning to Virginia. He and Argyll return uh, there in May of 1617, and Samuel Argyll would become the deputy governor. Smith's writings indicate that George Yardley invested his term as deputy governor in planting tobacco, which was a departure of Sir Thomas Dale's policy of planting corn. So I guess agriculture policy, the, the early formations of it, were likely a hot topic between the different deputy governors of the colony at the time. In 1618, a population migration began from England to Jamestown, likely being drawn by the riches being produced uh, of tobacco and possibly, very well possibly due to John Rolfe's visit with Pocahontas in England. This migration boom would take place over the next roughly six years. With this group coming in, this influx of people, comes smallpox, which decimates the native populations and in April of 1618 kills Chief Powhatan. So Chief Powhatan, Pocahontas' father, dies from smallpox and his brother, Ope Takanao, becomes the chief of the Powhatan tribe. Now, this is where longtime listeners of the podcast are going to be rewarded. Ope Takanao is the first uh, time we've ever heard that name on the podcast. Some historians believe, though, that Ope Takanao was, in a previous life or in a younger age, named Don Luis. And so, for those of you who remember, our podcast on the Exakin mission and the massacre that occurred there several decades earlier. They remember Don Luis. Well, it is believed that Ope Takanao may have been Don Luis because his name was translated into he whose soul is white. Other historians believe that Ope Takanao was a relation of Don Luis, either a son or a nephew. But in, uh, in, in any way, Ope Takanao was way more anti-colonist than his brother. And his subsequent actions in future episodes would, would show that. Meanwhile, complaints against Samuel Argyll began to mount uh, to the point where people were writing back to England complaining. 
and Lord de Loire, who had served as governor since 1609, but had really not been in the colony much for the last eight years, he decides to board a ship and go back to Jamestown. On his way to Virginia, de Loire becomes ill, and he dies at sea in June of 1618. It is disputed whether or not de Loire was poisoned and whether he had been buried at the Azores or at uh, Jamestown. So not a lot is known there about his passing and, and subsequent burial. The ship carrying de Loire arrives at Jamestown in August of 1618. At the same time, the Virginia Company in England formally accuses Samuel Argyll of embezzlement. The Virginia Company would ultimately adopt the Great Charter of 1618, which abolished the martial laws that we read about earlier, allowed property to be owned privately, and authorized the governor to summon a general assembly to consult on the colony's laws. Argyll would be deposed and returned to England in 1619. His replacement, the seventh governor of the colony, was former deputy governor George Yeardley. Yeardley would be the deputy governor in Jamestown in 1619 when two major historical practices begin in America. And we will start to talk about those next time on Historical Context. <music>